Grosso. Welcome to this video on audiograms. After this video, you should be able to describe the process of audiometry, demonstrate an understanding of how an audiogram links to tuning fork tests, diagnose normal hearing from an audiogram, diagnose conductive and sensory neural hearing loss from audiograms, and diagnose common causes of hearing loss from audiograms. Let's first quickly recap the bedside hearing assessments you will have practiced during the ENT examination, starting with Rini's test, which compares air conduction to bone conduction. Air conduction involves sound being funneled via the pinna into the ear canal, where it passes through the tympanic membrane and ossicles. Sound is amplified here because movements of the stapes footplate are translated into movements of fluid within the cochlea, resulting in neural stimulation. Remember, in Rini's test, if air conduction is louder than bone conduction, this is normal and shows sound can go through the middle ear amplifier. This is a positive Rini's test. During bone conduction, however, sound misses the ossicles and there is direct vibration of the inner ear fluids with no amplification. If bone conduction is louder, this suggests that there is a defect, either preventing the sound's route to the cochlea or its amplification. This is a negative Rini's test. Weber's test is a little bit more confusing to interpret. Let's say one ear was positive in Rini's test, i.e. bone conduction was greater than air conduction, shown here as a cross in the left ear. If Weber's lateralizes towards the good ear, the hearing loss is sensory neural. However, if it lateralizes towards the affected ear, the hearing loss is conductive. This being said, the nature of hearing loss is more reliably measured using the pure tone audiometry when it is available. An audiogram is a graphical representation of a person's ability to hear at different standardised frequencies. It builds on what you may have found with Rini's and Weber's tests. Whilst you are unlikely to be creating an audiogram yourself, it is important to know how they are done in order to interpret them effectively. Firstly, the ears are cleaned of wax and discharge. Then the patient is placed in a soundproof room and pure tones over a range of frequencies are delivered to the patient through headphones at varying intervals and intensities. Each ear is tested separately. The patient presses a button when they can hear a noise. The first noise played should be the one that the patient can hear, so the patient knows what the sound is and which ear they should be hearing it in. Once the patient presses the button, the noise is reduced in frequency by 10 decibels until the patient can no longer hear it. The process is repeated, but a bone oscillator is placed over the mastoid process, which vibrates at different frequencies. This vibration will travel directly to the cochlea and stimulate it. This means that we can test the function of the cochlea separately. The frequencies and intensity at which some common noises are heard can be shown in an audiogram. Although rarely done in practice, you can plot the average levels for speech, which forms the speech banana. You do not need to learn this, but bear it in mind as it nicely demonstrates why losing hearing at certain frequencies affects how a person hears speech, and therefore how they are able to communicate. This is a blank audiogram. Frequency is along the x-axis in hertz, and the intensity is along the y-axis in decibels. Normal hearing for an adult is between 0 and 20 decibels across all frequencies. A key is provided on the right of the graph, as symbols may vary. With this patient, we'll test the right ear first. Starting at a frequency of 1000 hertz, a noise is played that the patient can hear comfortably. The intensity is lowered in 10 decibel steps until they can no longer hear it. Once they can't hear it, the volume is adjusted up and down in 5 decibel steps until a threshold that the patient hears 50% of the time is reached, and then a mark is made. Next, the patient is played a noise at 2000 Hz at 25 decibels. They can hear it, so it is reduced to 15 decibels. They can no longer hear it, so now it is increased to 20 decibels. The patient presses the button, and another mark is made. The process is continued all the way to 8000 Hz and then back to 250 and 500 Hz before it is repeated at 1000 Hz. The whole thing is also repeated in the left ear. 
As the patient was consistently able to hear the noises below 20 decibels, they have normal air conduction in both ears. As air conduction was normal bilaterally, they have normal hearing in both ears. If you were examining this patient with a tuning fork, Rinne's would be positive bilaterally and Weber's would not lateralize. Conductive hearing loss is the name given when the sound is unable to properly reach the cochlear nerve. Regardless of whether the pathology is in the outer ear, tympanic membrane or the middle ear, the sound is unable to travel through the middle ear and is therefore not amplified as would be normal. There are many different reasons for this, such as otitis media, perforation, wax, otitis externa, otosclerosis, foreign objects and cholesteatoma. Now let's look at how conductive hearing loss presents in an audiogram. The test is carried out as before. Whilst the right ear appears normal, this time the patient's left ear falls around the 60 decibel mark. They have hearing loss in their left ear. At the moment, we cannot tell if this is conductive or sensory. We need to know the bone conduction. In this case, the patient records the following plot points, all of which fall below 20 decibels, indicating normal bone conduction. This demonstrates that the nerve is working appropriately, but there is a defect in the ear canal, tympanic membrane or ossicles. Therefore, this patient has conductive hearing loss in their left ear, possibly as a result of a titus media, perforation, cholesteatoma or middle ear tumour. Rinne's would be negative on the left and Weber's would lateralise to the left. Sensory neural hearing loss is the name given when the pathology is beyond the middle ear. Sound is able to be transmitted through to the inner ear, but due to disease, it cannot be transduced into neural activity by the cochlea and transmitted by the nerve. There are many different reasons for this, such as acoustic neuroma, Meniere's disease, ototoxicity, labyrinthitis, noise damage, head trauma, and presbyacusis. A patient produces an audiogram as before, demonstrating hearing loss in their left ear, particularly in the higher frequencies. Once again, the test is repeated for bone conduction. However, this time, bone conduction is also deficient, demonstrating that there must be a problem with the cochlear or nerve and making this unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. In this instance, Rinne's would be positive bilaterally, but Weber's would lateralize to the right. If you see an audiogram like this, you must first rule out an acoustic neuroma and organise an MRI scan. Other differentials could be surgical damage or noise trauma. Let's look at some common conditions and their audiograms, which you may be asked to interpret either on the ward, in clinics or during exams. This audiogram shows bilateral high frequency hearing loss. It is worth noting here that if bone conduction follows the same pattern as air conduction, it is often not displayed on the audiogram simply to make it more legible. Therefore, this is a sensory neural hearing loss and is typical of presbyacusis or hearing loss of old age. A particular issue for those suffering from presbyacusis is listening to speech. If you refer back to the speech banana, you can see that high frequency sounds such as f, s, ch and sh and many consonants will be difficult to hear. As the loss is bilateral, you are not likely to see anything unusual on tuning fork testing other than a gross hearing difficulty. This demonstrates the usefulness of an audiogram. The abnormal part of this audiogram is the dip at 4K. This has affected both ears and can be assumed to have affected bone conduction as well because it's not shown. This is noise induced hearing loss. People who are consistently exposed to loud noises, such as construction workers, musicians or military personnel for example, may present with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Whether the damage is acute or chronic, the loud sound overstimulates the fragile hair cells, leading to their permanent injury or death. Higher frequencies are more damaging to the hair cells, therefore noise-induced hearing loss has a typical tick appearance on audiogram around the 4000 mark. This patient has a low frequency unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, typical of Meniere's disease. In Meniere's disease, the hearing loss fluctuates, which is highly unusual. However, the hearing loss will become permanent and progressive and cannot be prevented even with treatment. In this instance, Rinne's would be positive bilaterally and Weber's would lateralize to the right, as we use a low frequency 512 Hz tuning fork. 
If you see an asymmetric sensory loss like this, you must first rule out an acoustic neuroma and organise an MRI scan. In this audiogram, both ears are affected and both show bone and air conduction deficits. Therefore, this is bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Although rare in the UK, a possible differential for bilateral sensory neural hearing loss is ototoxicity. It can be caused by a number of drugs, such as aminoglycosides, such as gentamicin, loop diuretics or aspirin if taken in high enough quantities. Other differential diagnoses could be trauma or bilateral acoustic neuromas if the patient suffers from neurofibromatosis 2, for example. Like before, this audiogram shows damage to both ears. However, bone conduction is preserved, indicating that this is a bilateral conductive hearing loss. The commonest cause of this appearance is glue ear. Bilateral perforations is a possibility, as is otosclerosis. Otosclerosis is a condition that lays down spongy bone around the staples foot plate. It is commoner in younger women and has genetic, hormonal and viral origins. This time, there has been little to no response at all from the left ear. This is known as dead ear. The arrows demonstrate that the machine was not loud enough for the patient to register a response. Although there appears to be a response to an 80 decibel noise at 250 Hz, do not be fooled into thinking the ear is working. This is the vibrotactile response. The patient is feeling the sound rather than hearing it. Common causes of a dead ear would be labyrinthitis, accidental trauma to the temporal bone, and post-surgical, if they've previously had an acoustic neuroma removed, for example. In this instance, Rinnies would be positive bilaterally, but Weber's would lateralize to the right. In this example, there is a defect in the left ear. Air conduction is significantly below normal, and so is bone conduction. However, there is a large gap between the air and bone conduction lines, meaning that there is both a sensory neural and a conductive loss. This is known as mixed hearing loss. Possible causes of this picture would be a cholesteatoma if it invades both the middle and inner ear, or trauma. Rinnies and Weber's are of limited value here and are unreliable in mixed losses. At the start of this video, we set out five objectives. Firstly, to describe the process of audiometry. Audiometry is done by playing pure tone sounds of different intensities and frequencies and recording which the patient can hear. Second was to demonstrate how audiograms are linked to tuning fork tests. Rinnies and Weber's are bedside tests, and although both measure air and bone conduction, audiograms alter the frequency and intensity and take more consideration of global hearing loss. They can be diagnostic in themselves. Third was to diagnose normal hearing from an audiogram. The plot points for both ears should be above the 20 decibel line. Fourth was to be able to diagnose conductive and sensory neural hearing loss on audiograms. When air conduction is abnormal, look at the bone conduction markers. If they are normal, then this is conductive, such as the Titus media. However, if they follow air conduction and are abnormal, this is sensory neural, as in an acoustic neuroma. Finally, you should be able to diagnose common conditions from their audiograms. Although pattern recognition is key, you should also understand why these conditions produce their characteristic audiograms. Important ones to recognise are presbyacusis, noise induced, many airs, ototoxicity, bilateral conductive, dead ear, and mixed hearing loss. Not forgetting unilateral sensory neural loss, which could be an acoustic neuroma. That completes this tutorial on audiograms. You should now test yourself with the accompanying assessment. Good luck and whole vow.